So today we're going over the ultimate beginner's guide to 3D printing. So what can be 3D printed? You've got solid objects, hollow objects, any geometry, impossible parts to machine, parts within parts, solid, flexible, plastic, metal, and more. It's become extremely popular for toy models, movie props, prosthetics, medical device parts, aerospace parts, and even fashion items, and food products such as chocolate. Even if you don't have a 3D printer, you can learn how they work and how to use them in this video right now. 90% is learning to tune. Now 10% is learning the specific machine and material you're using. So here's the process. You start with a 3D model, and this can be created in CAD, SOLIDWORKS, Fusion 360, Maya, or any other 3D modeling program, as long as it's exported as an OBJ or STL file. A slicer application like Cura or Simplify 3D then turns the 3D model into a toolpath, which is readable by the 3D printer. The printer takes the material and then squeezes it through a hot nozzle in a very specific pattern, melting small lines of plastic into a larger complete object. So that's the basics. Now let's go over the Vision Miner model of how we go into every project we do. First, we look at design and modeling. This is super important because 3D printers do have limitations. You've got to take into account the layer style printing that you're doing, putting down the material in layers. You can design parts specifically to be stronger and print faster than their conventional counterparts. Number two, we evaluate the part. We evaluate parts to determine potentially problematic or difficult sections of the part, which will need to be tuned or redesigned in order to print properly. Easy parts don't require much tuning, but once you get into bridges and overhangs and small gaps or holes, sharp corners or long parts, especially in the high performance thermoplastics, uh, there's a lot more legwork to making the process work. So number three, slicing. Slicers are a software that turn a 3D model into a toolpath. A toolpath is basically code which tells the 3D printer where to move. This is where tuning comes in. There are thousands of settings that the operator needs to tune in order to print properly. For basic materials, most slicers also have a beginner option, but this doesn't always work that great. There are plenty of slicers to choose from out there on the internet. The industry standards are Simplify 3D and Cura, followed closely by Slicer. These brands have large community followings and years of resources online in the forums and everywhere else that you can learn from still today. Now, number four is tuning. There are literally hundreds of settings to choose from, which will affect the way your part is printed. From basic settings like temperatures, retraction, and speed, uh, there are also many advanced settings like outline overlap and thin wall behavior settings. All these come into play when you're printing your parts. When you print a part and it doesn't come out perfect, this is where tuning comes in. Based on the error, you'll be able to determine what settings to change and fix your part. So number five is producing. Once you've tuned your part, you can go into production. Maybe you're just doing a one-off part for a friend or you may be printing a thousand fasteners for an electronics project that you're doing. Depending on your goals, there's a lot of different ways to set up the G-code to meet your needs. For example, printing batches of multiple parts at the same time. So after the tuning process, you can effectively print that part over and over and over again with the same results. So how the printers work. There are many kinds of 3D printers from FDM to SLA to SLS to DSLM to DLP and all kinds of different acronyms that uh, mean all kinds of different things. Now today, we're mostly focusing on FDM. FDM is Fused Deposition Modeling, also known as FFF, which is Fused Filament Fabrication. Now, Fused Deposition Modeling is a trademark term by Stratasys, and they've owned that term for the last 30-something years. So you'll see this a lot. You'll see FDM, FFF, FDM slash FFF. They're all the same thing. FDM is moving a nozzle around and squeezing melted plastic through a tiny nozzle. And this is what people usually refer to when they say 3D printing. Now, there's also SLA, which uses photosensitive resins cured with a laser or a, a digital projection screen. And it's often far more detailed than anything you can achieve with FDM. Now, kind of the middle ground, but a little bit newer in the industry is SLS, selective laser sintering. SLS is kind of a middle ground, which uses powdered materials laid in microscopic flat planes, melted together with a laser beam one layer at a time. So each process has its own advantages and disadvantages, whether that be build time, quality or cost or consistency. Next, we're gonna go over filament types. You've got a few different grades from the hobbyist grade materials like PLA and PETG, or even ABS, which is what Legos and car bumpers are made from. 
PATG is actually extremely good at chemical resistance, so it almost falls into both categories. Engineering grade materials are like nylon and polycarbonate and, and TPU or TPE, which is thermoplastic elastomers or urethanes. And they can be used in many demanding applications. Now, high performance polymers, these are like PEAK and ULTIM or PEI. They're far more expensive, but they're extremely strong. They're resistant to all kinds of forces. And they're usually used in the high end scientific, medical, automotive, and aerospace industries. Next, we have printer grades. So you really have three different grades. First, there's hobbyists. These are great for PLA, smaller ABS parts, and basic materials. So with hobbyist grade printers, these generally run about $200 to $1,000. The nozzles go up to about 250 Celsius, the beds will go up to around 120 Celsius, and they generally don't have a heated chamber. These printers are great for PLA, PETG, small ABS parts. Generally, they don't have enclosed chambers. Sometimes they have heated beds, and they typically suffer from weaker frames. They're not as tight, so your accuracy can be less, but it's generally okay, and you can usually tune these in pretty good. Engineering printers is the next level up, and these are designed for engineering materials like nylon and polycarbonate. They're going to have higher nozzle temperatures, bed temperatures, and often include actively heated chambers. When you get into engineering grade printers, these usually run anywhere from $1,000 to $25,000. Now, these nozzles usually go up to 320 Celsius and are all metal. Uh, the beds can go up to 160 Celsius or so, and sometimes they even have a chamber, which can either just be ambient temperature or it can be heated usually up to about 60 Celsius. These are great and what you need for nylon, polycarbonate, big ABS parts and things like that. These generally have a much stronger frame and they're a lot more rigid to provide better accuracy of your parts and repeatability. Next, we have high temperature printers. So the main difference here is going to be in build quality and of course the chamber temperature. So these printers are designed for polymers that are being extruded at over 400 Celsius like Peak and Ultim. So with high temperatures exceeding 90 degrees Celsius constantly, 24 hours a day, the build quality has to be on another level. You're running this hardware in production facilities for 24 seven and it has to be built to a higher standard to be able to withstand all that. When you get into the high temperature performance plastic printers, and these are ranging anywhere from $7,000 to $500,000. Generally, the nozzles will go anywhere from 330 Celsius to 550 Celsius, which is over 1,000 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, the beds range anywhere from 160 degrees to 250 degrees Celsius, and the chambers can go anywhere from 90 to 300 Celsius. You're basically printing inside an oven. Uh, these are what you need for materials in the high-performance polymer range, like peak, PEI, which is Ultim, and PPSU, and other high-performance thermoplastics. These have very high temperature beds, high temperature chambers, solid metal billet frames, and extreme precision accuracy. So as you can see, there's a wide range of options to choose from. And the difference, they, they really all do the same thing. The difference is what you can do with them, how big you can print, how hot you can print, and the types of materials that are available with the specifications they have, as well as how accurate and how well built the actual machine is. If you get a cheap machine, chances are it's going to break uh, pretty often, or it's you know, going to come out of the box and it might not be right. But if you go for the high temp or engineering grade printers, and you spend a couple thousand dollars, especially up to $20,000, these machines are going to be dialed in, very, very well built, and made for high precision production, prototyping, and engineering grade work. Now, a lot of you know that you can actually take a $200 printer and turn it into an engineering grade workhorse, but this will take a lot of work, a lot of know-how, a lot of little upgrades like the hot ends and the firmware and accessories and things. You have to have a lot of time to tune it. There's going to be stuff that goes wrong and there's going to be no support for it except for the forums and what you can find online. So if you need something to work great for high precision stuff right out of the box, we don't recommend going with the $200 printers unless you really love it and really want to get into tuning it. Next thing to look at is the printer features. What is an extruder? Basically, the extruder mechanism is what squeezes the plastic through the small hot nozzle at different temperatures based on what material you're printing, and it kind of works like a pen. 
It moves around the plate and draws your part layer by layer. There are many options for single, dual, triple, or even quadruple extruders. Some experimental machines out there are actually using more than that, but generally are looking at one to two extruders per machine. This generally allows the support material to be a different polymer, such as PVA, which is water soluble. So when your print is finished, you just soak it in water and the supports fall right out. Sometimes you can also use different nozzles uh, if you want to achieve different levels of detail on different areas of a part. And now that we've covered the basics, let's talk about what you can and cannot print. Beginners should start with basic shapes. No crazy angles, overhangs, holes, bridges, or, you know, stuff like that, just to get started learning how the material behaves and how you should work with it. You can go online and find existing models on websites like Thingiverse and use their suggested settings and adjust them to work with your printer. Start by printing a part that takes five minutes. This is the best way to learn. You'll really get it down pat if you do really short, fast iterations. More advanced users can move into the complex geometries, the overhangs and the bridging. Depending on the material and the printer though, uh, these may require some extra tuning and that's something that you'll always have to do when you switch to a new material. Expert level users can generally find a way to make it work most of the time. This involves a printing objects at different angles, extreme temperature adjustments during the middle of a print if you need to get small details without melting everything else down or using multiple processes to have the bottom of a part completely solid and the whole top part totally hollow. When you're tuning, there's a few things to always look for. Number one is a perfect first layer. If that first layer isn't looking perfect, it could ruin your entire print. So always restart when you see errors like that at the very beginning. You're only gonna lose two minutes to five minutes, and believe me, it's worth it for the quality of your part. Number two, surface quality. If your surface quality isn't coming out smooth, it might be your extrusion settings, you might be over extruding a little bit, or you might have you know, the other layer heights not quite tuned in. But it might just be that your printer needs a cleaning. You always gotta thoroughly clean, degrease, and re-lubricate your X, Y, and Z axis and clean any gunk out of your extruder gears and things like this. It's only gonna cause problems. Replacing nozzles and heat breaks is also recommended on a regular schedule as we've seen a lot of these materials actually wear down the nozzle in much less time than you think. And then you'll start getting like wavy patterns and your parts just won't be looking right. And you'll be tuning, changing settings and it's just not worth it. And then you're like, oh, well, how's my nozzle? And then you put a new nozzle on there and it's perfect. So always make sure to check the hardware, clean out gunk, lubricate, etc. So number three is your part orientation. Are you printing that part in the best orientation? If it's gonna be a strong part, is it printing flat across the area which is gonna take the most stress that you have the strongest orientation right there? Or do you have a lot of overhangs? And sometimes there's a way to orient the part differently so it uses less support on those overhangs. Surface details are another thing to look at. Uh, because of the accuracy on the X and the Y axis, you can orient parts differently to achieve greater detail in some geometries. So how do you get started? Honestly, if you're just getting started in 3D printing, you don't even need a printer to experience it. You can actually start by downloading Cura, which is a free slicing software, and then going to a site like Thingiverse and picking a free model out. And this way you can import the model and start tinkering and playing with all the different settings and learning what that does as the part builds and doesn't build. And you, you get an idea of what you're in for. Uh, so to take it further, uh, many local libraries, makerspaces, and schools have 3D printers on hand now. Usually they have programs for the community to take advantage of it. So if you don't have any friends with 3D printers, you can always go to the, the library and use theirs. Now, if you want to, you can start with a $200 printer. Uh, these come in a kit which you'll put together yourself and it'll actually give you invaluable insight into how a 3D printer works. And you'll experience how it's very much like working on a car or any other mechanical object. If you know what you're getting into but only want basic materials, uh, there's some great machines out there uh, for a few thousand dollars. If you want to learn first but get into the high performance polymers for your first real project, then you can always start with something like a FunMat HT or a Cincinnati and work your way up from PLA and ABS up to the more advanced materials as your skills improve. Now, if you're an engineer, this is probably where you'll want to start. 
if you start with an advanced high temperature printer, then you won't be limited by low temperatures on your cheat printer or not having a hot enough bed, or you'll already have a chamber that's ready to go if you wanna do big nylon prints or whatever it is you're trying to do. It's really easy to find online resources for tuning, troubleshooting, and optimizing your 3D printers. And the resources are only getting bigger. Now is an incredible time to start and get ahead of the industry as we move into literally a new age of additive manufacturing. Anyway, we hope you like this video. Feel free to ask questions in the comments below. And as always, hit that subscribe and notification bell. Have a positive day and we'll see you on the next video.